Used to watch them here 30 years ago. To me, running dogs are something really quite exciting. But before a dog can race here, there's a long chain of events that goes back to even before it's born. Paradise Kennels near Buckley. This is where young greyhounds come to learn the trade. This is where they turn from puppies into racing dogs. The ancient Egyptians used dogs like these 5,000 years ago. Hairy tailed versions. Imagine one with a woolly overcoat and you've got an Afghan hound. A big Persian one was used for wolf hunting and they were dogs that chased their prey by sight. They don't hunt by scent. Gaze hound is an old name for them. The Romans had them, the Saxons made a virtue of them. In medieval times, they were the prerogative of nobility, really. A Welsh definition says that a gentleman is one who owns a horse, a hawk, and a greyhound. King John gave tax relief by taking greyhounds in lieu. And Edward III was into greyhounds as well. So there were more greyhounds about in the royal palaces those days than there were corgis, believe me. Dame Juliana Berners in 1481, in the Book of St. Albans, defined the perfect greyhound. And 500 years later, her definition's still as good. She said it should have a head like a snake, a neck like a drake, a tail like a rat, a foot like a cat, a back like a beam, and sides like a bream. And that sums up the confirmation which our friend Bally Pierce Starr here shows perfectly. He's got his coat on to keep him warm, but there you can see under the coat is a classic looking greyhound. A dog for all seasons. Paradise Kennels is one of the region's leading training establishments and the trainer there is Peter Beaumont. For him it's a full-time job and he's a real expert. What about your day's routine? What time do you kick off in the morning? Well, we usually start here about seven. I like to see those dogs going up the field after the yard around about seven in the morning and, uh, and then uh, it's, the normal day finishes around about half five, six o'clock. So is it, what is it first? Exercise first? Exercise first. I like, I like to get them all out as quickly as we can in the morning and let them have a good empty out and stretch the legs. Not too far first and then we start then on the, what we call the second time round. That's when the exercise and then the, the, the donkey work comes in with them. When do you feed them? Well, they have a light meal round about nine o'clock and the main meal round about four. What's the main meal? Isn't the main meal comprises of uh, cooked beef and raw beef veg and toasted bread, balanced diet, great. It sounds a pretty full day to me. What yes. about race day? Is that well, different? Well, race day is a different day altogether, a different day altogether. Um, of course, the, the dogs which are racing just get a, a, a small handful in the morning, just a drop of liquid, and uh, they're then just taken out emptied probably twice and kept reasonably quiet, uh, checked over, rushed over, groomed up, made them look nice, and uh, all ready for action. Do you think they know it's race oh, day? Oh, they know it's race day. They know it's race day. It's a certain excitement, hasn't yes, it? Yes, I think it's a certain, uh, it's surprising how they do know. It all happens here, doesn't it? From birth right through, everything takes place around here. From the start, yes. You we have the stud dogs. <coughs> with the you? stud dogs and uh, the people, we mate as own bitches and uh, people bring bitches to be mated. So we do everything. So even before they're born, it's arranged. 
Absolutely, yes. Yes, absolutely. How many young do they have? I mean, what is a decent litter? I would say the average litter is between eight and ten. Some litters are small as four, and some are as many as 12 and 14. I think the record is about 18. But the average is between eight and ten. When do they actually start training? Well, they've, they've uh, 12 months to uh, grow up in before they really start, down to the serious work. But of course, during that 12 months, there's always something to be done with them. It's bred in them to chase, but some, some of them are reluctant sometimes, and we've got to get the old rag going. And this the old rag? I mean, this is yes. a lure, is it? Something lure, really... yes. Back of the bike wheel, you know, the bike wheel. Yeah, I've seen folks use the bike wheel on a bit of cloth. Yeah. Yes, yes, well, it's still used. It's still as good a method as any. And do you have to teach them ordinary lessons, ordinary commands? And yes. They, they all seem very obedient. Yeah, well, right? well, of course, these are like, these are the, these, as I say, these are the finished product, these. We let them run a bit wild early on, but they've got to be learned, broken in onto the lead, of course, which is not always easy. Got to learn how to kennel, and, um, oh, there's a lot of, a lot, a lot of, uh, different jobs to be done with these. Can you give me an idea how much it would cost to keep a dog in training? I would say the average ground in training is costing about 14, 15 pounds a week. That's for its food, its keep, its transport, so on. That's right, yes. And of course, there'd, there'd be um, additional fees of vet fees and um, little bits and bats which crop up in between. I see you've got some equipment here for treating things yourself, so... Yes, we, we've managed to do one or two minor ailments. Of course, we've got to be able to uh, assess what the problem is pretty sharp on after a race and if we think it needs a veterinary surgeon well of course we we get them straight down to them so we can say 14 15 pounds a week basic you might get away with 20 pounds a week on average and uh, that will keep your dog running yes yes i think if you uh, start reckoning but of course once he starts running you see he's getting his money from the track so if you can keep him oh, yeah. running it, it all offsets the, uh, the expense itself yeah. yes when we were on the way up, I noticed you've got a flock of geese in your front garden. Are they part of the working staff? Oh, yes, yes, that's Charlie and his angels. <laughs> <laughs> they're, uh, they're very good, the geese. Um, what we do, we put them in the paddocks around the back of the buildings at night. Because, obviously, if you came out of the house every time a greyhound barked during the night, you'd never, you might as well put your chair in the yard. <laughs> But the geese are very good, and any noise or anybody, any disturbance or anything, because obviously security is a big thing. We have the um, our station, the Doberman guard in the front, but we can't, you can't be the geese around the back. Oh, these are a grand looking pair. Yes, they're very nice. How old nine months they? old. Nine months old, eh? Yes. Brian Sisson's had an important job. He's in charge of security for the National Greyhound Racing Club, the ruling body of greyhound racing in Britain. Have you been responsible in part of your security role for these dogs? Yes, well, when each litter, if every litter, if they're going to race NGRC, yeah. must be earmarked, and we always earmark the puppies in the right ear. Oh, I see, yeah. And in this yeah. one, which I, I did about three months mm. ago, you can see the earmarking green, J-I-P-3. Yes. Looks like a tattoo. Yes, exactly. But the ear is pierced completely through, but it yeah. doesn't show at the yeah. rear end. But yeah. at the front, it's quite distinguishable. Yeah. Yeah. And it stays yeah. with them for the rest of their life. Yeah. The final check, and by far the best check, is looking at the toenail. Now, oh, if you yeah. look at this yeah. one, little Sue here, she's got two dark, a yeah. medium dark and a yeah. very light one. Yeah. Now, I haven't looked at this one yet, but I would guarantee that the left foot of a sister is completely different. These are like fingerprints, then. See, they've got yeah. the light, four light yeah. toe nails, so yeah. there's no yeah. way they can change those. That is convincing. Nobody's going to work a flanker and put a ringer in when you've got a description like that. No, because besides the earmarks, you see, each pup or each dog, as it's turning into racing, has one of these completely filled out. And the racing manager on all the tracks have this. Wherever these yeah. puppies will race, this that, identity, identity bill yeah. goes with them. It's a little them. passport, really. Yes. Yeah. Well, the security must be a big thing. And, I mean, one always imagines in sport where gambling's involved, the tight security is what keeps the punters happy, really. Yes. Yeah. Well, you'll not get the punters going to the track unless they're, you know, fully assured that the security <laughs> is tight as possible.
Well, what about the owners? Those who put up the money in the first place to buy the dogs and keep the sport alive by their interests. By the way, watch this white dog. It hasn't learned its manners yet. Well, B. Scott, you're an owner and you've been a very successful owner in a short period of time. Who have we got here? Well, this one's D. City. This was the one that um, was given to me as a present and she turned out to be a top-class dog. This is a mother who raced the spring heels. <laughs> and that one is D's Galaxy. D's Galaxy. That yeah. one is grandson to this one. Good Lord, so we've got three generations yes, here, the yeah. dogs. What about this one, your absolute star, D City? She's what? obviously won big races. Yes, she's been marvellous and I was very, very lucky that she was my first dog ever. And my hopes now are to have another one like her. So you're going to breed from her? Yes. Oh, mm -hmm. that's nice. So, yeah. I mean, really, when you got her, was it luck or was there more to it than that? Well, no, not exactly. My nephew um, saw this dog, this bitch, uh, being exercised by a man who obviously wasn't concerned about her and that he wanted a coursing dog. Ah. So I said, if you don't want too much for that uh, greyhound bitch, I'll buy it from you. And he said, you can have it, I'll give it to you. So he took it home and groomed it and found this earmarking, sent it away and found out that it was, she had been a very good racing dog. So then he set to work finding out who would be a good dog to put her to and put her to Franz Josef and this was the result. It's a terrific story, isn't yes, it? Like you yes. say, well, what are the joys of actually being an owner and being a winner? Well, the joys are endless. Uh, it opened up a new sphere of entertainment for me and I travelled up and down to Wembley, White City and all those places. Met a lot of interesting people and um, you never lose interest in it because you sort of go into the breeding and from now onwards we can't wait to see what's going to happen with these puppies and from then onwards. Well, this fella here, D Galaxy, is christened me twice. I hope that doesn't happen again. <laughs> Not all owners are as successful as D. Scott. It's good to have a big winner, but for most owners it's just a matter of having a bit of fun and enjoying a hobby which partly pays for itself and maybe makes a bit extra. I talked to another owner, Jim Foster, about the facts of an owner's life. Well, Jim, how did you get into being a ground owner? Well, I started going to Leeds and uh, I thought I'd have some of my own dogs, so bought these about eight weeks old. I raised them till I was 12 months and I brought them to the trainer, to Peter's, and uh, now racing at Sheffield with them. What's the cost like? Well, it's not too bad if they're, when they're racing. It didn't cost me much to raise them at home, but when they're racing with the appearance money and you're winning, winning fees, it's not too bad. Well, that little bit she's been injured about, she got injured about three weeks ago. It gets a bit costly then. Yeah. But it's not too bad if I share with a friend of mine. And it's not too bad when you share the cost sort of stuff. You know? Yeah, so a partnership lightens the load. Well, it does, yeah. And uh, there's nothing greater like to see your own dog on the track and winning its races. You know, it's great fun, actually. Well, it, it must be a kick, yeah. It is. What about the prizes they can win? I mean, how much can a dog win? Well, uh, that depends how good the dog is. These will run for about £20 if they win and they get six to £10 appearance money. Mm -hmm. well, they have quite a few sponsored races at Sheffield, which brings the prize money up. I mean, they yeah. can be racing for 500 3000 if the dog's good enough. What's the biggest prize that there is in ground racing? I should imagine the Derby, which is about £25,000 probably for the winner. £25,000. everybody's wow. dream, I should imagine, to have a Derby winner. So now our dogs are ready to race and it's back to all at on a wet night. The preliminary rituals must take place first, weighing, identification check, veterinary going over, number check, and the excitement mounts towards kenneling time. It's all exciting stuff for me as well. There was a time when ground racing had a real cloth cap image and was looked upon as less than respectable by some folk. But that's all changed now and it's a well-run sport. 
that protects the interests of the punters, the operators, and not least the dogs themselves. It's always been a good night out to me, a bit of fun and a flutter. Most of the harem scarem on licensed flapping tracks have gone now, and the rules under which dogs race have become pretty strict, but this is all to the good. You back your fancy, win or lose, and you can be pretty well convinced that it's your judgment of dog flesh that's on the line. You can't ask for more than that. Tee's Galaxy's looking good, so I think I'll forgive him and have a little bet. Well, Peter, how many dogs have you brought tonight? We brought 15 down tonight, Michael. 14 runners and a reserve. I hope they've got water wings. Well, they're going to need it if it keeps on like this, aren't they? But fortunately, it's, it's sand at which we're running on. It's a sand surface, and uh, it's nowhere near as bad as the old grass surfaces used to be. So the going really will be quite fair, will it? Well, obviously, if it keeps raining like this, it could become a bit dicey later on, but it shouldn't be too bad. Yeah, well, you must have had a wet journey down. Yeah, well, of course, they uh, well, we coat them up, they're all well coated up, like, and they coated up back into the kennels, so we try and keep them as warm and dry as we can, as comfortable as we can, so they do the best when they get out there. So we're going to look forward to a good night's racing, then? Well, we hope so, we hope so. Meanwhile, back on the track, it's not yet time for the actual racing, but there's something to look at. Some dogs have to run speed trials to qualify for future races at the track. A sort of preliminary examination. So there are a few extra runs to watch. These runs are a good guide to the knowledgeable for spotting future stars and give the dog some useful practice on this particular track. Now it's time for the real racers, and here come the traps. The big question is, will the rain stop, and will it affect the racing? Certainly it looks as though they'll make a start, and there's a good crowd all ready to back their fancies. Ladies and gentlemen, there are now four minutes to the off. Watch your feet, dear. One race, one loser. Just about par for the course. I remember when I used to come here 30 years ago, there was a little dog called Mad Astley. Little strotty thing it was. And I always thought I could find one to beat it. And I never did. I always lost my money. You know, racing grounds, some of them are real personalities. In those days, the name of Mick the Miller was still on the pedigree part of the race card. I mean, Mick the Miller, a legend. Won the ground derby in 1929 and 1930, two years on the trot. He's stuffed now in the Natural History Museum. Whenever I go to London, I go down and have a look at him, and he stands there, four square, a nice brindled dog. I hope he never gets mothed. His record of races in a row lasted till 1974 and it took another little gem, West Park Mustard, to win 20 in a row and put an end to his record that had stood since the 30s. The names come back to you, you know, Monday's News, Endless Gossip, 
Oh, man, Tannis. They were all great dogs. And who knows, tonight we might see another one out there with just that sort of calibre about it. Anyway, we'll see. These Galaxy who did the dirty on me is running in the next race. He's not fancied, but I've got the feeling he might just win. Decent price the bookies are offering too. Found to win, please, these galaxy. These galaxy. These galaxy. Yeah, found to win. It's, uh, four pounds to one will say thirty-five. Thank oh, you. Not bad. They ran like a bomb there. How do you feel about that? Oh, I feel absolutely delighted because, as I told you yesterday, it was only a puppy. Yeah, and how many times has he run here? About six times. Well, he knew his way around tonight, yeah. didn't he? Yeah, he did extremely well, didn't he? Run by a street. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, next time you see him, thank him very much, will you, from well, me. You He's restored my him. fortunes. <laughs> Okay. Now then, can I take can I take some money off you? You can. It's a pleasure. Uh, number six for these galaxies. Five pounds. Five pounds. Yeah. Right. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. How's it going tonight then? Oh, very well. Thanks. You've got a fairly active crowd here. Yes. Sir. <laughs> How many well, betting that the fourth race won't take place? Oh well. <laughs> Relying on the weather, aren't we? Well, the rain is giving up. Uh, <laughs> when was the last time it was as bad as this? Any time it rains. Cue <laughs> 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 for a song. <laughs> <laughs> Every time it rains. 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 How long do they give it? I mean, to recover. Till the runs out. They have to let you in free, you see, if they get beyond the fourth race. But they'll try their best. <laughs> so we're desperately trying to get yes. into the fourth yeah, race. Right. So that they don't have to let us in free next time. Oh, round. well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They'll get this over if they push it down, won't they? Well, I reckon the ninth <laughs> race will be the 130 <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> well, I was wrong. The rain didn't give up, but the hair did bogged down in the mud. It'll take a miracle to get the rest of the racers in. Time to take cover. Well, this is the best place to do your racing when it's raining, in the bar. What they need out there is a hair dryer, believe me. And what I need is a good wet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. They're a determined lot, these greyhound fans, young and old. They stay on to the bitter end. There's the fella that's giving all the trouble. A half-drowned hair. He's got something in his circuit. Any suggestions what we should do with it? <laughs> Take it off and wipe it. I think we'd be better off shooting it, myself. Anyway, he may yet recover. <laughs> he has done. Miracle, miracle. <laughs> I knew we could do it. So the fourth race started, but it was all to no avail. The dogs caught the hare as it bogged down yet again. That was a bad end. Aye. I suppose it happens at times. Aye, so there's a two and a one there. Seven, Seventy-three and seventy. A two and a one. Okay. Three pounds. Three pounds. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, well, we'll come back and try again next time. I'm glad to see you. Cheerio. <laughs> Here's the fellow that caused all the trouble. Still, he was fast enough to beat two of my dogs. Here today, gone tomorrow. Mm-hmm. 
Thank you.